I'm Stephanie Mumby, and uh, kind of felt like tonight I, I would introduce myself a little bit more officially than I usually would, just because, you know, it's been a minute. So uh, I've been thinking a lot the last week or so just about how long I've been here at the Father's House and uh, how many things I've seen happen here at the Father's House. Um, I moved here from Canada at 24 I am now 41, so you do the math. I was a baby when I got here. Like, sorry if you're younger than 24, um, but I was. I was a baby. Uh, an adventurous following Jesus baby, but I was still a baby. And uh, Jordan and I, my husband, uh, we started School of Transformation, which, well, what is now School of Transformation, back in 2007. Uh, we ran it for 13 years, so... Uh, and then, you know, when George got sick and passed away, then, you know, Maria took the school on after, after Derek. And, you know, you guys have what you know today. But, you know, I, I did, the, I ran the school and started the school. And we, the school went through many, many, many shifts and changes in the 13 years that we ran it. Um, and it was really incredible to be part of that process because we came here as little babies. You know, I was 24 and George was 28 and we didn't have any kids yet. And, uh, you know, we, it, was, it was a try, fail, learn procedure with school. Um, I was actually sitting here tonight trying to remember what, it, what was it called at first? And then I, I remembered. But um, anybody in here that was in intern school, that was our very first name for it. Joe Bestwick over there was in intern school. Nolan was in intern school. Um, Miriam was in one of the earliest versions. Ildico was in our very first class. Um, and she was even more of a baby than me. So... <laughs> Anyway, it was good. They were they were good adventures, you know. And I've been here for a long time, and I've I've seen a lot, and I've I've uh, learned how to follow Jesus a lot, you know, through things that are difficult or things that we don't understand. And uh, I've come out I've come out pretty strongly, you know. Even even through walking through George's cancer and and his passing away uh, this spring will be four years. So, you know, it, that's been a minute too, you know, and, I, and I've grown up in that as well. You know, I've grown up in, in single parenting and I've grown up in, in how to work and minister here as a, as a single lady raising four kids, you know, trying to figure out how to make all that work and how to, how to grieve in a way that is going to still make me safe for other people, how to grieve in a way where grief doesn't become my God, where Jesus stays on the throne in my life no matter what, you know? And, um, and in that process, what I've come to love more than anything is Jesus himself, and I've come to understand him more and more than I ever have uh, through the Bible um, as I have pushed in hard for truth. Because the harder my life has been, the more I have needed truth. And so um, I'm just going to share, you know, a little bit with you tonight about some of the different things he's showing me. I had a really difficult time trying to decide what to talk about tonight because... Like, there's just so much good stuff in there. It's like you're just reading and you're like, oh, that'd be so good for a sermon. You know, and you, you read again and you're like, oh, that would be so good for a sermon. Like, why can't I do this every single day? Because I learn and it becomes real and true for me. I understand it because I'm a verbal processor, right? So when I'm teaching it, I get a deeper revelation than just when I read it. So I wish, you know, that there was someone who wanted to listen to me every single day so that I could learn more every single day. But anyway, that's, that's kind of enough of that. But anyways, we're going to just get started on, on the official teaching. Uh, let's put up Galatians 3.3. 3. I'll just let you read it. You guys ready to go? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit... Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Okay, that's the word. 
well, it's going to be all, all, all along these lines. You can leave it up there. It's good. It's a doozy. I want you to, I just want you guys to stare at that while I, while I talk for a minute. The, the question that I felt the Lord ask me for us uh, today, as I've been just thinking about all of these verses that I've been reading, his, his question is, are we living by his holiness or by ours? Are you being transformed by his holiness coming to life in you? Or is it your holiness? Whose holiness are you walking by? Because his holiness, when it comes to dwell in you, from the inside, brings everything that you are to life. But when we are holy in our own strength, we slowly fade away and die because we cannot transform ourselves. And so the yoke of holiness becomes too heavy to bear and we are slowly sucked dry into nothing. And so if your life as a Christian right now has any dryness to it at all, any tiredness to it, any weight to it, then I would propose to you that your Christianity is a holiness of your own making. Because his holiness, when he comes to live in you, everything comes to life. The colors come to life. Work comes to life. Loving people comes to life. Being a Christian comes to life. There is nothing that is too difficult when his holiness is bringing you to life. You will be more alive than you have ever been. So let me read Galatians 3, 3 one more time. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Have you become your own perfecter? Do you read your Bible and do you see the words that it says and do you look at them and you think, oh, I've fallen short. I'd better do something about that. Or do you fall on your knees and say, Jesus, I've fallen short, help. Because there is a difference. Allowing his holiness to live in you means that he does the hard work. You participate, but he does the hard work. He does the transforming. He does the changing. He does the bringing to life. But when you perfect yourself by your flesh, it only lasts so long. All right, let's keep reading. Just have to decide where I want to go. You know, Paul talks a lot about the law. Now, I know that he's talking to Jews a lot, or Jews and Gentiles, okay? So that's why he's talking about the law. But these people that he's writing to had a received Jesus. Would you agree with that? They had met Jesus, yes? Because, you know, even what he writes to the Galatians, right? They began by meeting Jesus. They began in the spirit, but they quickly came back to the, the, what they had known before, which was the law, right? The law is your flesh perfecting itself. It, there, it's a bunch of rules that we follow so that we can be holy. And so Paul is writing about the law over and over and over again. I, I have so many verses, I may not get to them all because but he, he, he talks about this constantly. Why are you going back to the law? Why are you going back to perfecting yourself? Why are you going back to an external system of government when Jesus came to set you free from the law? He, he came to bring you to life. See, Everything that Paul wrote about the law, see, it applies to us too. 
because we look at the New Testament like a law. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. Right? See, the law is meant to be written on our hearts. There is supposed to be a transformation that happens on the inside when the Holy One comes to dwell in you, when His holiness comes to dwell in you. You are supposed to be transformed into the law. It's not a box you put yourself in so you don't break the rules. You become the rules because everything in you wants to be pleasing to him. Your heart beats with his. His life flowing through you and in you, cleaning you and changing you. But not under the law. It says um, in, uh, we don't need to put this one up, but in Galatians 5 verse 1, Paul says this, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. See, what they've done is they've traded one yoke of slavery for another yoke of slavery. The The yoke to the slavery of sin for the yoke to the slavery of the law. They just put on another one. Because the law was actually supposed to, to set you free. It was supposed to make you holy, but it didn't work. So what it did was it illuminated sin. And you've all been there, right? We've, we've all had sin illuminated to us. So the need for a savior illuminated to us. We've realized that I was under the yoke of death. But have you traded that yoke for another one? A yoke of the rules of Christianity? So you live right, go to heaven when you die? Or have you been brought to life? Have you been brought to life? And if you have been brought to life, are you still alive? Or did you do what all these people that Paul was writing to, did you do the same thing and just sink back into what's easy, what's comfortable, the rules that you know how to follow? Go to church, read your Bible, do devotions, worship, serve the poor. Or are you alive with him? Is his holiness living in you Do you get excited about being with Jesus? Do you get excited to read your Bible because it is life to you? Because he's alive in you when you read it and that truth is everything that you need that you are hungry for and you are only satisfied by him. Well, good, we got one. If you're not, I'm trying to make you hungry. (laughs) Okay, Jen, I got (laughs) you. Galatians 3.23 says, Before faith came, you were kept in custody under the law. You were in jail. But, But see, Paul's also trying to say you're you're in jail again you walked right back into that sucker because for some reason being in jail seemed easier because you know what to do see when you're with Jesus and it's about his holiness and it's about what he wants anything could happen anything could happen. He could ask you to do some really scary stuff. He might ask you to sell everything. He might ask you to give everything. He might ask you to pray for somebody. I know. Don't get crazy now. He might ask you to give away 
your present or your car or, I mean, it, what, whatever. He might say, move to another country. He might say, don't worry so much about your kids. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Mm. Mm. But see, that's where life is. Life is with him and he's doing things. He's moving. He's got an agenda for today. He's got stuff he wants to get done and he wants to get it done through you. He doesn't care if you checked off your devotion for today. He doesn't. He wants you to be obedient to what he's asking for you today. He doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to be uncomfortable because he wants to live through you. He wants you to get the yoke of slavery off. See, this is, this is supposed to bring you to life. The words in here are supposed to inspire you. It is not a to-do list. Do this, don't do this. Do you know that it, it says in a, in a few different places, you shall be holy. What does holy mean? Well, let me tell you. It has to do with being pure. It has to be, it has to do with being consecrated. Anybody know what consecrated is? means that you've been set apart from the world, that you are undefiled. Let me ask you a question. Can you make yourself holy? Does reading your Bible and worshiping and doing your devotions and your 10% tithe, does that make you holy? No, but we think it does, don't we? Doing the right stuff is never going to make you holy. Because holiness is about the inside of you. It is about being pure and undefiled. It means that the world has nothing on you. And the only one who can make you that way is him. And the one who's convinced you that you can do it yourself is Satan. He can make you a Christian that has no need for a savior. That's exactly what Satan wants you to be. A Christian who can go through the motions that has no need for a savior. And maybe, just maybe, you'll get to heaven when you die. Sorry, I'm not very nice when I'm up here, am I? You can laugh, it's fine. Okay, we're all on the same adventure. Okay, I've been going through the motions too. When Jesus said, hey, whose holiness are we going by here? I was like, what? What do you mean? He's like, yours or mine? I was like, uh, lately mine? He's like, how about mine? I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You're full of good ideas, Lord. <laughs> Undefiled. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. See, that's in Leviticus. Do you know what's interesting about Leviticus? It's part of the law. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because they were using the law to be holy. And a lot of people lived by the law so they could be holy, but it didn't work. So we had to have a better idea. And that better idea was Jesus who died so that we could be pure and undefiled so that we could be washed clean so that the Holy Spirit could come and dwell inside of us. I might go over tonight. Just heads up. I'll try not to go too far, but I haven't even gotten to the good part yet. Okay, we're going to go to Galatians 5. This is where I was actually supposed to end up. Galatians 5, verse 16. Here's how we do it. 
So Paul talks a lot about, let's not live by the law, guys. Don't go backwards. Who has bewitched you? What are you doing? Stop. Turn around. Go back to what you first knew, okay? In a nutshell, there's Paul. But then he has these instructions for us, this clue into how it is that we're actually supposed to live by his holiness. So let's read. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You can hold there. Just pause there. There it is, guys. That's the key. What is the desire of the flesh? See, in this context, from what, what Paul was just talking about, about the law, we just finished, I didn't read it, but he was just talking again about not living by the law, right? He says, walk by the spirit because that is the only way you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What is the flesh's desire? It is to be comfortable and safe. It's whatever is easiest. It's whatever feels good to me. Whether that's sin or whether that is living Christianity in a way that is safe. But the only way to not do that is to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. So you can't have both. The Holy Spirit is like, hey, guys, let's go do something fun today. Good, thank you. Let's go do something fun today. I've got a plan for you today. What do you want to do, Holy Spirit? Oh, I got I got big plans. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this thing that I want to work on, and I want you to go love on this person, and I've got generosity for you here, and I'm gonna give you some wisdom for this other person who needs it. I got plans for you today. But see, then there's our flesh. It's like, yeah, kind of rather have a nap. I'm just going to go to work and get my job done. Maybe I can get home without talking to anybody. (laughs) For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Now don't get crazy here, Steph. I don't actually have to listen to the Holy Spirit as a Christian, right? I can just have what I want to have and do what I want to do. And I've prayed the prayer, so we're good, right? No. See, it says there in verse 17, so that you may not do the things that you please. See, you're not the boss anymore. He is. So now we have a problem because guess what? There's now a war inside of you. Your flesh wants one thing and the Holy Spirit wants the opposite. So who's winning? See, did you just put Holy Spirit to sleep? And you're like, oh, maybe I'll talk to you at church. Or, or can, you even, can you even feel the battle anymore? Like I said, I'm not super nice. I smile a lot, though. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Again, we can't have both. You can't just live the rules of the New Testament and be led by the Holy Spirit at the same time. Because you don't need the law when you've got the Holy Spirit. You don't need an external system of rules when you've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the law. And he came to bring his holiness to life in you. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. 
Okay, now you're probably thinking, don't, well, at least I've got, I'm pretty good there. But let me just remind you, see, sin comes out of our want for comfort, our need for comfort. So when we put the Holy Spirit to sleep, or we set him aside, we will find ourselves doing these things. Now, at least, maybe not some of the really bad ones. But when's the last time you felt envious of somebody? When's the last time you participated in dissension? Because I bet it wasn't that long ago. Maybe you haven't killed anyone recently. So you're probably okay there. There is some good news. But what about anger? What about strife? What about jealousy? Because the very end of that sentence is, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now remember what he just said. There is a war inside of you. Your flesh wants the lazy thing. Even a lazy Christianity. But his spirit, see, his spirit has a job to do. And it is to bring you to life. It is to bring you to holiness. And it is to, um, wow, my brain just shut off. Okay. And it is to do his mission through you on the earth today. Whatever that looks like. It may not be extreme, guys. It could just be the person sitting next to you. But you can't just put him to sleep and then wake him up when you feel like it. Okay, let's just go on a little bit further. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is verse 22. Now we've heard this one a whole bunch of times. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Why is that again? Oh yeah, because the Holy Spirit is the law. He's the boss. And when he is the boss inside of you, these things are going to be no problem for you. Because he's there to resurrect you. He's there to heal you. He's there to transform you. Do you know that grace, see, we we think of grace sometimes just as like an accompaniment to um, salvation. Grace is his transformation of your heart. That's what the word grace means. It means that he comes in and he operates and he changes you and he heals you and he makes you like himself. Oh, and then it's reflected in life. That's what grace is. His grace is actually supposed to be operating in you. It is supposed to be doing something. It's like a a surgery. Grace is like a surgery in your heart where he's bringing you back to life, where he's bringing you into his holiness, his wholeness. See, that's why it's the fruit of the spirit. See, we read the fruit of the spirit as if it's like some clothes we got to put on. Oh, I got to get my church clothes on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Maybe we keep our church clothes on most of the week. That's good. I hope so. Right? But, and, and, and please, you know, while he's doing his surgery and, and healing you and doing his thing, you know, you know, you can keep the, the clothes on, the, the holiness clothes. That's good. But. But like those things are supposed to be a reflection of what he has done in you. Those things, the fruit of the spirit is a reflection of his grace in you. His holiness in you, not yours. And I just go back to the very, very first verse that I read. Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This is a question we we need to ask ourselves. We really do. Like, I know I was black and white, and I know I was maybe being a little funny, but and maybe and maybe a little mean. But these are his questions to you, not mine. 
Have you forgotten how to let His holiness work in you? Have you forgotten how to be perfected by His holiness and not your own? Don't be perfected by your own strength. Come to Him. This is very simple. For tonight, this is very simple. Sounds complicated, but it's not. The other thing is, is it sounds scary, like he's going to ask you to do something you really don't want to do. Anybody just kind of nod at me if you were like, yeah, I'm not sure I want to give up control because he might ask me to do something I do not want to do. But here's the thing. It's okay to say, Jesus, I don't want to do that. See, there's like a relationship thing that you're supposed to be walking in, right? Where you can say, Jesus, I, I don't, I don't want to give up all my money. I, I don't want to give up all my time. I don't, I don't want to talk to that person. And, and he might say, but would you anyway? And then you can say yes or no. I mean, I recommend saying yes, but at the very least, you can say, Jesus, you can change my mind. You're asking me to do something I don't want to do, but you have my permission to change my heart. I've done that. And guess what? My heart changed and I wanted to. Didn't change begrudgingly because he was twisting my arm behind my back. He's like, smile, smile. You can do this. No, he changed my heart. I wanted to. In fact, it was actually about coming here. Way back. I didn't want to come here. And he changed my heart. Took three weeks. But guess what? I'm here and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So let him do what he wants to do. And if you've been trying to do this on your own strength, just tell him, Lord, gosh, I realize I'm doing this on my own strength. Could you take over? And he'd be like, finally, absolutely. Let's go for a ride. Do you know, I rode in my uh, cousin's Audi something. Is Jack in here? What was it? it was, oh, is he not in here? You can yell at me, Jack. What was it? An R8. Anyway, that car went really fast. Okay, so I don't know if you don't know what that car is, it's a sports car, it goes really fast. Okay, now my cousin let me drive it. It was terrifying. Okay, that thing goes way too fast. I felt like I was gonna fly off the road. But here's the thing my cousin, it's his car. When he drove it, it was really fun. And it's kind of like that with Jesus. When I try to drive the really fast car, it doesn't work so good and it's really scary. But as soon as I actually let him take over, I'm safe. And it feels really good. And we went flying and it was really fun. And that's where Jesus wants to take you. He wants to take you flying. So, all right. So let's, uh, let's just pray. I went like way over, but at least it's only 736. Maybe worship was short. I don't know. Okay, listen, though, I am going to encourage you, please, even if it's just really fast, five seconds, because just if this, if you know this was you, just take a second and just say, Jesus, I'm going to give up the control of my holiness. I want your holiness to be at work in me. And I'm, I'm just going to share this very one last thing. The impression I had today when I was sort of preparing this and thinking about it is that this isn't just so he can have control. He wants to set things off in you. He wants excitement and fun in your Christianity. He wants excitement and fun for this church. He wants life. He wants us to not be able to wait to get to church. He wants uh, worship to just be like off and cracking. 
right? This is this is not supposed to be like, oh, dude, did you go? Let's go to. Okay, it's Wednesday. We got to go to church, right? He wants to do something, and he wants this message to want you to want him to do something. So please take his invitation. Thank you so much for watching this video. We really appreciate it. And please make sure that you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any of our videos or our live stream. You can also support the Father's House financially by clicking the gift button. Thank you so much for watching and we hope to see you again soon.